I want to start off with some questions. Why are young children's genitals being mutilated? Perhaps the parents feel like they want their children to be happy because maybe they themselves grew up unhappy and they are afraid that their children are not going to connect because they feel what they feel, and the parents want to have their children happy and connecting. Why do some promote abortion? Perhaps the parents also feel like, well, my children are going to be unhappy. Or the person, both male and female, think, this is going to be a burden and we are going to be in pain and frustrated because children are going to be in the way for us to achieve what we want to achieve. They're afraid. Uh, people do all kinds of crazy things because they fear disconnection. Perhaps they feel ashamed and so they might fear rejection. Oh, if they find out that I'm pregnant or my girlfriend's going to have a, a baby and I can't handle it, I'm ashamed, so I don't want rejection. Uh, our motivations for doing crazy things. And the world is always offering fake connection, right? And it seems like very attractive connections. Just look at the commercials. Right. Uh, every Friday night, every Saturday night, the bars are filled with promises of connection, fellowship. And it happens. Only it's very, very unhealthy connections, poisonous connections. But for the moment, it feels great. For the moment, it feels very good. But it's poison to the soul. And God knows all this. And God came down from heaven to restore and to reconnect people in a healthy way, in a loving way, in a fulfilling way. Connect people back to God, to God himself, and with one another. But we live in these times, it's always been, where False connections are promoted. Remember the woman at the well, uh, John 4? Jesus goes and to reach out to them, and the woman didn't know who Jesus was, and Jesus tried to, look, uh, I know, and so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus was telling her, hey, I've got water to give you that, you know, you're no thirst again. And the woman was a little sarcastic and some people when they've been around they very street savvy and they can come back with sarcasm <laughs> well where's your bucket and your well is kind of deep i don't see your hand reaching down there haha -ha. jesus finally had enough He's like okay go get your husband uh, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah you've had five and the one you're living with now is not your husband oops I think you're a prophet. <laughs> yeah. Your attempts at connecting. Your attempts at connecting have led you down this path. And, you know, again, the world offers all kinds of false ways to connect. And why is it so powerful? Why is it so powerful? Some women are willing to walk around naked or half naked or just about. And some men are willing to do just about anything to connect. It's very, very powerful. Why? 
Because God made us to connect at all levels, body, soul, and spirit. That's our very constitution. That's our very nature. That's our food. Only when we eat the wrong food, as poisonous, then we end up with woundedness and frustration, confusion, hopelessness, and away we go. So we have to be honest about where we are personally, right? Because he has to start with us, not somebody else. It has to start with us. So we raise the question, how are your connections? Because you see, we can spew out all kinds of moral platitudes and all kinds of Bible verses and all that, but our relationships tell what's really going on, right? What's the quality of our relationships, of our connections? What's wrong? How are your loved ones or friends connecting? Are they connecting? In a healthy way, in a loving way, and you know that there's strength there? Or are they connecting in illegitimate ways that are only going to lead to more pain and frustration? Do we know how to develop healthy connections? Right? Because that's the question. If there's all kinds of this drive that's there and is very strong and we've messed up and messed up and messed up, how in the world can we connect in a healthy, loving way? You see, God has given us the church. And the church is to be the agency by which there's healthy connections. The way God designed it, because God designed this is our very nature, right? We say, the Bible teaches us, reveals to us that we're made in the image of God. And there's a million things to learn about God, right? But one of the main things is we know that God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, but one God. Mysterious, yes. But what we find out is that God is a social being. Right? Three persons, they're so connected, so beautifully connected, that they are but one God. And we are made in His image. We were made to connect in holy, loving ways. And when we connect in holy, loving ways, ah, life and power and beauty, you see. But when we're not connecting in holy, loving ways, frustrations, pain, loneliness, Confusion, hopelessness, and down we go. Anxiety, big time. Stress, our hearts can't stop because we're anxious because of lack of connections. God's social design, he designed us, created his image, was disfigured. It was disfigured at the, at the fall. But he's restored it, of course, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believers are called to help others fellowship. We're called to help others connect in a healthy, loving way. That's what we're here on earth for. To represent Jesus Christ who connects us back to God. And we end up connecting in a healthy way with one another. That's the one of the jobs of the church. Right? And so, uh, the past few weeks, we've been going over our vision statement and then our purpose statement. And let me see if I can get this thing going here. Um, just to be able to uh, um, do we have it up there or no? Nope. Huh? Just start the PowerPoint. It is on. Start. <laughs> okay. So here it is. Uh, we say worship is the center of all of our lives in, in the church, in all of life, right? John 4, 23. And then we say everything that we do, everything. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat or drink, everything, do all to the glory of God. That's, that's life, right? And we went over worship. 
there should be four or five sermons just on worship alone and all the other essentials. We have five essentials. And so then we looked at Christian education, right? And then today we're going to look at fellowship and then eventually outreach as well and then stewardship. But today we're looking at fellowship, fellowship, because that's another essential of the church. A church must have this, connecting this fellowship. So, um, and how to develop that. And in our purpose statement, and our, uh, we say that to the glory of God, living word is designed or here to carry out the responsibilities, right? And it's through the love of God. That's the, should be our motivation, the glory of God and the love of God. It's not money. It's not popularity. It's not even worldly success. No, it's the glory of God and the love of God should be propelling us. And when the glory of God and the love of God is propelling us, listen, no one can stop you. No one. Because that motivation is of God. Whether you're rejected or accepted, it doesn't matter because your focus is on the love of God and the glory of God. You see, and as a church, that's what we're to be about. And we're to be helping people know God, but it takes discipleship. It takes carrying on and teaching others, right, about who God is and what it's all about. And so we come to community, community, and so we define community in a certain way. What do we mean by community? And this, this is for all people. Whether in the church or outside the church, I mean, this is what it needs to be, right? So here it is, to receive from and to give to one another. There's some mutual giving and receiving, right? And that's very important because some of us, it's a hard time to receive. We're too proud. What, me? I don't need you. I don't need anybody. <laughs> I... I'm not going to receive from anybody because then I'm going to be weak. Then I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm not going to share anything about my weakness. You set yourself out to be lonely. You might be respected because you have a lot of knowledge, but there's no connections. And when there's no connection, there's a misrepresentation of who God is. Right? So it's very important that there's a mutual give and take. To receive from and to give to one another materially and spiritually. On what basis? Because of believers' participation in what God is. Amazing thing. Amazing thing for Peter. That we can receive the very nature and the very being of God. We can be a part of that. Right? And out of that, we say, it's through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from that, we are able to give to others and give and give and give and give. But again, for some of us, we can barely give a smile. <laughs> We're so empty and fearful ourselves. We don't have anything to give. And God says, mm, I've given you everything that, I, that you need, right? So let me look again at the fact that we're made in the image of God uh, to be in a continuous relationship with God and fellow man. We are social beings. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. This is uh, when God had created both Adam and Eve. And then he says every time he created something, it was very good. But then for the first time, we read that something is not good. And what is this? Genesis 2, verse 18. Then God, Lord, the Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a uh, helper. Really, it should be uh, another being that corresponds to him. Not just a helper, but another human being that corresponds to him. And he, uh, this other being is going to help man achieve what he cannot achieve alone. Right? It's not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helpmate. 
uh, suitable for him, that corresponds to him. This is God saying that, right? Now, um, in chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 27, in chapter 1, verse 27, God said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Keep the earth and rule over it. Right? That's what he told them. So Genesis 1 is kind of like the summary of creation. And then Genesis chapter 2 start doing some of the details. Right? And how, how it all happened. So here he had commanded them. And now it's like, there's Adam in chapter 2, but no Eve. Well, exactly how am I supposed to multiply? <laughs> so then God says, okay, uh, Adam, I want you to go name all the animals. And he goes out and names all the animal, animals. And then it says, um, verse 20, Genesis 2, verse 20. The man gave uh, names to all the cattle and all the birds of the sky and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helpful, a help suitable for him that corresponds to him. So Adam was like, ah, oh, uh, okay. Now I've made you aware of the need. Okay. So then God caused Adam to go to sleep, right? It took a rib and created the woman. And then Adam is like, whoa. <laughs> Woo, talk about Miss Universe. Verse 22. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The first wedding ever God performed it. And the Hebrew there, verse 23. And the man said... Woohoo! Talk about a 10, 15. <laughs> it's beautiful. That's the sense. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now look at this. Therefore, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and join to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the one flesh is far, far, far beyond the physical. Body, soul, and spirit. All right? And then look at verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Absolute purity. Absolute freedom before God. Absolute connection with God and with one another. That's the way the Lord designed it. They were both naked and were not ashamed. Wow. Wow. What a incredible freedom and joy. Right? That's the way the Lord designed it. Um, and when we live accordingly, that's when human beings are the most satisfied, the most at peace, the safest, everything, everything. Right? But then what happened? The fall. Right? The fall. God gave them in chapter 3, uh, uh, chapter 2, but in chapter 3 they fall. And Satan comes as a snake, tempts them, and they eat. And look at what happens. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Genesis 3 starting in verse 6. Genesis 3 and verse 6. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Boy, talk about today, right? Look at what you see, like, whoa. Look at what this meds or this toy can give you, whoa. What we see and we go by what we see. To make one wise, she took from the fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband who were the husband with her, and he ate. Now what happened? What happened? There was alienation now between human being and human being. And then there was alienation between the human beings and God. And that's what we live today. That's what we live today. A break in fellowship, a break in connection, 
broken. And now there's shame and there's fear. And now the mechanism of let me hide. Because now we read in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were open and they knew they were naked. Point. They were now ashamed. They were now ashamed. And they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loin coverings. Now there was shame. Fear of rejection. Fear of that disconnect. And not only that, not only just between them, but now between them and God. Verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and among the trees of the garden. Breaking of that fellowship. And ever since then, men and women have attempted to reconnect. But only they try to reconnect without God. And it ends up in a mess. A huge alienation, shame, fear, separation, break, anxiety, stress, fighting, clawing, whatever it takes. I need to have my way because I'm going to be rejected. That's what we have. That's what we have. And from then on, God began to bring back restoration, right? The rest of the Bible is... That, bringing the restoration and even beyond restoration, the glorification of everything. Because God, man, when he does something, he does it right and he does it good beyond our imagination. But just, I mean, (laughs) he promised them Adam and Eve, a savior, and then all the way down through all the Old Testament into the New Testament, into Jesus Christ. Right. And okay. Jump way over to the New Testament in 1 John. 1 John towards the end, uh, because I <laughs> need to summarize here. 1 John chapter 1. Look at, look at what, what happens here, because God is interested in reconnecting us in a wonderful, good way, in a life-giving way, not a poisonous way. That's what Satan tries to do, to connect in a poisonous way. It's counterfeit. But look at what it says, 1 John chapter 1. This is uh, the Apostle John, the one with Jesus, who was Jesus, whom Jesus loved, it says, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now he's writing, 1 John, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Doesn't that remind you of the Gospel of John chapter 1? Right? The very first verse, the same apostle. The gospel of John. How does it begin? In the beginning was the word. And how does he start this, this, this one? Verse 1. What was from the beginning? This is the same John. Right? And he's talking about Jesus. And he's saying, look, man, look. We experienced Jesus. It wasn't just some fantasy. Some fairy tale. No, 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 no. We touched him. We saw him. We were with him. Verse 2. And the life was manifested and we have seen it. He kind of repeats the experience again. Uh, We have seen, we have testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life. The life that God promised and wants us to experience. Which was with the Father And was manifested to us. They were in fellowship from all eternity. Verse 3. And once again, he like, what we experience, we want you to experience. What we have seen and heard and proclaimed to you. So that you too may have what? Fellowship. Connection. The very connection we had with Jesus who was connected to the Father from all eternity. We want you to experience that. You see that? Fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy or your joy both may be made complete. 
This is what we can offer to the world. And this is the real healthy medicine, uh, healing, uh, real wonderful connection. Because there's all kinds of counterfeit in the world. And people do all kinds of crazy things to try to stay connected or not be rejected. But here's the real, real solution. The real healing. Right? And so that's what we have. What's the foundation of it all? That Jesus came. He died for our sins. Was buried and rose again from the dead. He conquered death. The very thing you and I fear. The very thing you and I fear. And listen, death can be of all kinds, right? Just think of it. Just think of it. What would happen if all of a sudden all your clothes fell off right now? <laughs> fear! I mean, huh, or aren't you afraid sometimes that you're going to say a stupid thing? Man, I better shut up because I'm going to say something stupid and then I'm going to be... We all have this fear and anxiety. Um, Jesus says, I know. And you know what has kept you away from God and from one another? The same thing that happened with Adam and Eve. Sin. Sin. And you can't do anything about it. Because to do something about it means eternity of paying for it. Can you pay eternity for your sins? Not in eternity. You will never, ever be able to pay for all of it. So Jesus says, I'm eternal. And I'm going to come and pay an eternal price for your sins. And that's what he did. He came to pay for all, all, all of your sins. It'd be a trillion sins or the worst sin anyone could ever do. All sins. That's the power of the cross. That's why we worship Jesus. Into eternity, we're going to be still finding out the depth and the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because that's what he was doing. And so you see, that's what brings us freedom back and connection back with God. Have you trusted in Jesus as your Savior? Have you looked to him? Not your goodness. Not whether you go to church. Not whether you give money. Not whether you light a thousand candles. Not if you've been on your knees for ten hours or more. No. Putting all your trust in Jesus Christ's work at the cross. That's what saves you. That's what reconnects you back with God. Have you? It's a decision that only you can make. Nobody can make it for you. So we beg you, if you've never trusted in Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That is the word of God, not mine. The word of God. So that's the foundation. That's the foundation. To be able to be connected back with God. Right? But now... Uh, the ongoing life, right? How, how do we stay connected with God in such a way that we're fellowship with him? Once you've trusted in Jesus, you're connected with God, period, legally. But just like with parents, right? Uh, those of us that have children, uh, no matter what those children do, there are children, right? There, whatever, there are children. And when they misbehave and they're not doing what is right, what's the relationship like? Is this still like, oh, very happy and no matter what? No, there's some tension. There's some tension, right? We're the same thing with God. We're children of his when, once we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But man, if we live in darkness, the relationship is not good, even though it's still there. So now the Apostle John is going to enter into that, okay, in verse 5 of 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. Right? Absolute holiness. If we say that we have fellowship with him 
and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Oh, no, no. Praise the Lord. I, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm doing this stuff over here that's not right, but I'm not, yeah, praise the Lord. No, no, no. Your relationship with him is not good. We can deceive others. We can even deceive ourselves. But we can never, ever deceive God. He sees right through it. He sees right through it. And so the Apostle John says, look, man, you want to continue fellowship with God? You better be straight up. Be honest. Open and honest with him. Because if not, you are lying. That's what he's saying right there. You say you have fellowship with God and you walk in darkness. You lie and you're not practicing the truth. What happened to Adam and Eve from the very beginning? Lies and more lies from Satan. And they gave in. Lies only end up in disaster. That's what happens. And so now he says, you don't practice the truth. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light, open and honest, as he himself is, is in the light, we have what? Fellowship. Connection. With one another. But you know what? When we walk in the light, what What happens? A lot of dark stuff comes out like, whoa, man, that's ugly stuff in my heart. Oh, no. And that's why almost immediately, look at how the verse ends. Verse 7, how does it end? And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see? That's walking in the light. Lord, I, 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 I messed up, Lord. Here's the truth. Okay. In fact, now he goes on to, to demonstrate how it all works. Right? Verse 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins. Confessing simply means saying the same thing that God already knows. Saying the same thing that God already knows. If we confess our sins, he'll forgive us every once in a while. <laughs> you that what it says? Read it carefully. <laughs> Look what it says. He is faithful and just. Faithful. He will always, always, Always have forgiveness for you and me. Always. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's how we maintain connection with the Lord daily. Hourly. Moment. Every moment. Right? Be open and honest with God. And so... This is the way it is. In fact, when we do that, when we do that, we walk in the light, there's going to be humility because I, I'm more aware of my failures. And so then we're going to have this forgiveness for one another. We're going to enter into fellowship with others knowing that we can't judge them because God has had mercy and grace upon us. Then we're going to be, be able to pass it on for one another. You know what that co that's called? That's called love. Love. Love at being seen honestly and clearly. The darkness. But offering forgiveness and gentleness. Love. And when that happens. Now we're talking about power. To witness. Power in showing others the love of God. In fact, Jesus says, this is one of, going to be one of the most powerful ways you can be a witness for me in the world. If you have love for one another. You see? And that's what the church is supposed to be about. Uh, the Gospel of John 13. The Gospel of John chapter 13. 
Jesus is instructing his disciples before he leaves. <clears throat> and in verse 34, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, and verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Even as I have loved you. How did Jesus love the disciples? How did Jesus love the world? You know, the beginning of it? He spoke and lived the truth. That's how you love people, right? To speak and live the truth. You don't have to be condemning anyone. You just live according to God's way and man. Either they're going to hate you or they're going to love you. Right? Even as I have loved you. Jesus didn't throw the sins under the rug and whatever. And like, no, no, no. At one point he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about all that meek and mild Jesus? No, no. He spoke the truth and lived the truth. Even as I have loved you. That you also love one another. Right? And when that happens, when that happens, look at verse 35. Look at verse 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. That's the power that the church can have. Is loving, holy relationships. I mean, and you can take that at, at any level, at any level. When you have really, really a good, good friend. Other people at work or at school or whatever is like, man, I wish I had that type of relationship, that friendship. When you have a really, really awesome marriage of truth and love, man, it's beautiful, it's powerful. And take it at any level. And a basketball team, in a company, when you have that type of, no, it's powerful. Powerful. Well, Jesus is saying, you're going to be the most powerful witness for me? Have love for one another. But where does it start? It starts by we being connected to God and walking in the light, you see. Then we will have this ongoing spreading of the love of God and be powerful witnesses for God. Now, that's all the foundation. And God has called you and me to be the agency by which that light and that lifestyle spreads through the darkened world. God created the church to help the darkened, fallen world. Right? And so, um, the church is the agency that's to bring about reuniting people with God and with one another. The church is the agency that God created to be working to reunite people with God and one another and unite them in a healthy, loving way. So for that, there's many passages, but Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, the Apostle Paul writing to, the, the, to Ephesus, to the believers said Ephesus. And um, we read here, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, starting verse 11. Ephesians chapter 4, starting, by the way, uh, <clears throat> well, let me start in verse 1. We want to be here a while. <laughs> uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. You were called to be a believer. You were called to walk with God. Right? Uh, with which you have been called. How's that, Paul? With all humility and gentleness and patience, showing uh, tolerance for one another. Uh, in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Why should we do that? You know why? Because it represents the oneness of God. Look at the next verse. Verse 4. There is one body, one Spirit. Just as also we were calling to one hope, one call of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God 
and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There's that oneness again, right? There it is. That's the way we represent God, to having that beautiful, powerful oneness. It talks about Christ having gone, paid for our sins, went down to hell, so to speak, rose again. And what did he do? What did Christ do? Look at verse 11. Verse 11. And he, that is Jesus, the one who went down to, ascended down into hell, so to speak, and then on back up to heaven, he, he, verse 11, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Jesus equipped the church, right? Jesus equipped the church for what? For what? Look at the next verse. Verse 12, for, here it is, the equipping, the leadership, spiritual leaders, for the equipping of the saints, meaning the leaders are to be discipling, 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 helping others with all the teachings of Christ, right? Discipling, equipping them. For what? Keep <laughs> It's right there, okay. It's right there. Look. Um, for the work of service, the Greek word there is ministry. Ministry. It's not just the spiritual leaders, the pastors and teachers and evangelists. No, it's you, the saints. We're to be discipling you so that you can do the ministry. Surprise, surprise. But that, I'm not making it up. Look, it says right there. For the work of ministry. To building up of the body of Christ. This is the way the church is supposed to be built. You see? Don't look at me that way. It's your service, man. It's supposed to, you're supposed to be doing it. It's right there. Until, look at verse 13. What's it all about? So the body can mature. Be mature. Verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. A mature man. Not a church that all of a sudden some new fad comes along and woo, we go after it. No, no. No, no. Maturity. To the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. It's pretty mature to be like Christ. The whole body is supposed to be like this as a church, right? And when that happens, ooh, power, ooh, strength. Look at verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried away, away by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, craftiness and the deceitful scheming. There's all kinds of ways that even within the church, there's all kinds of scheming, you know. If you just use the right color in your bulletin, you'll get more people. If you have all the goodies out in the foyer and all the sanitizing and the bathrooms are immaculate, you get more people. Do we need that? Well, of course, we don't want to be pigs. But the soul, is it being changed or not? And that takes steely, powerful, biblical truth and an application of that truth to really change people. It won't be carried away by every wind of doctrine and trickery and deceitful scheming. But how do we proceed forward? How do we proceed forward? Verse 15. That's how we do it. But speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth with the purpose of helping, of strengthening, of nourishing, of giving grace, right? Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. My goodness. So the manner in which we do it, the manner in which we do it, speaking the truth in love, right? And then, everyone's supposed to be involved. Every one of you. Are you 10 years old? 8 years old? Are you 95 years old? Some of us look like that. 
Everyone is to be involved. How do I know that? Look at the next verse. Right? Verse 16. From whom the whole body fitted, uh, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies. You see that? Every joint supplies. Every church member. According to the proper working of each individual part. Causes the growth of the body. For the building up of itself. And the foundation is in love. You see that? How? My, my. The word of God is just like right there. Right? You don't need to go to seminary. It's right there. Right there. See? The motivations. The manner in which we do it. The purpose for why we do it. Why are we here on earth? It's all there. It's all there. Uh, oh, man. Okay, first application. <laughs> um, first John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, we went over verse 5 and following. Just as an application. Live in the light. Walk in the light. So, here's the application. Right? Number one. Get into a lifestyle. Not a momentary every once in a while. No, no, no. A lifestyle of living in honesty. Soul honesty. What is really there in the heart. And it needs to be a lifestyle. Not like, oh, Monday morning, I better confess. Or whenever. No, no, no. A lifestyle. When you're at the light, somebody cuts you off. When you get tempted, when you fall, when you're eating, what is the actual truth of what's inside of me? Because that is walking in the light. Right? And when we walk in the light, we better stay close to the blood of Christ because that's what cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's going to be an ongoing realization. Man, I need Jesus every moment. Right? But live, decide, I'm going to get into this lifestyle, this mode of living, of being honest about what's really there in my soul. That's the application number one. Application number two. Uh, pick one or two individuals, maybe three, but one or two individuals that you can develop a deeper relationship with. You see? And usually these individuals need to be those that you sense and you see that they're willing to struggle with the truth. Now, somebody that's always has it perfect and there's nothing wrong and blah, 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 blah. No, 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 no. You see them struggling with life. Perhaps at times you see a tear coming out of their eye because they're being honest about life. That may be a good candidate for you to start opening up to. Uh, real interesting in Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18, and I found this, I was looking at this. How apropos it is for today. Proverbs 18, verse 24. Look at this. A man of too many uh, friends comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. The sense is you can have many friends, superficial friends. Uh, friends that will stick with you as long as you're buying uh, friends that will just make you feel good. But when the chips are down, when you're down and out, they're nowhere to be found. And that sets you up for ruin. And unfortunately, social media has done that, no? Social media. With maybe hundreds and hundreds of friends, but lonelier than all get out. And people lose themselves so alone. So alone. They have lots of friends. But there is a friend. And by the, fr by the way, the two words for friends are not the same Hebrew words. The first one is more like a, a fellow, like an acquaintance, like a, you know, maybe a neighbor from a distance. And notice it's plural. <laughs> friends. Right? 
But the one in the second part of the verse is singular. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Meaning, there is quality of relationship. Quality of relationship. And that's what you and I can be doing. One or two, maybe three individuals that we open up to. And we see them wanting the things of God as well. And, you know, isn't that the big thing? Because you can have, quote, unquote, good friends that want nothing to do with God. They never bring up God. And when you do bring it up, yeah, yeah, and go on to the next thing. No, no, no. You need friends that are also willing to wrestle with the relationship with God and in life. You see? Because that's what we're going to be strength. That's what the church is supposed to be about. So that's application number two. Pick one or two individuals whom, with whom you can deepen relationship. Now, before I go on to the third one, I want to, I'm just reminded, praise God for the develop, uh, uh, creation of the church. Praise God for the creation of the church. I know the church has all kinds of problems, and the world church, oh my goodness, it's so superficial and so money-hungry fools and power-hungry fools. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. But the true church of God, this is God's agency to help a dying world, a world in darkness. And it, it takes hard work, but God has created the church, and praise be to God for the church. But one last application. Uh, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament, when uh, the church had been given birth, the church was just born, and look at the activity of the believers. Acts chapter 2, start in verse um, 42. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they, that is the believers, look at this, and they, the believers, were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, Christian education, and to fellowship, this connecting with one another, right? To the breaking of bread and to prayer, spending time together, eating together, connecting with one another, you see? And when the church was born, it was powerful, powerful, powerful. Because there was love, love. And that's why sometimes it takes sacrifice to say, you know what? I could be going elsewhere. I could be going to the beach. I could be doing all these things. But no, priority. I'm going to spend time with fellow believers. Because this is what's going to develop into a powerful church that can then help others. See? But it is a sacrifice. We all have to make those decisions. Will you? Praise be to God for the church. And every one of us, what every joint supplies, every one of us is to be involved. It's right there in the word of God. But will you? Will you? Maybe fear will keep you away. I don't want them to know my weaknesses. I don't want them to know my shame. Is that what's keeping you? Remember, that's what separated Adam and Eve from one another and from God. But the choice to say, no, Jesus took care of all my sins. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to trust God that he's with me. I'm going to be open and honest with just a few people. God help me because I'm scared to death. Will you? Your choice. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the church. Thank you, Father, that you've called us to represent you. What an incredible, meaningful, powerful motivation to represent the God of all the universe. Lord, help us. Thank you again for the great, great forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. Be with us, Father, and be with anyone who just trusted Christ this morning. Lead them to learn more, Father whether it's through us or anybody else. Thank you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let my life be the